Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Lister, and I run a research lab here at the Perkins. Uh, and what I work on is the epigenome. And so today, I'd just like to briefly uh, give a, a presentation uh, which is focused upon telling you about what the epigenome is. It's this code which sits on top of our genome and, and regulates the underlying genetic information. So I'll give you a, a bit of an introduction into the biology of the epigenome. Uh, what is involved in the importance of it to our health, and uh, some of the technologies, key technologies that we're using to study the epigenome and the genome, and a little bit of some of the work that we've been doing in this area in recent years. So uh, we're all obviously made of a, a huge variety of different, uh, both tissues but also cell types. So in our body we have approximately 30 trillion cells, and uh, throughout uh, our body we find there are hundreds of distinct types of cells. One of the major questions in biology, uh, which a lot of people around the world are trying to address, is how this great diversity of these hundreds of different cell types uh, it forms from the information that is present in just one genome sequence. Because essentially all the cells in your body have the same genome sequence, but they uh, manifest these very different forms and functions. So we can look at the, the genome and the genes within the genome. In our genome, we have about 22,000 genes. We can look at it somewhat like a parts list, the bits and pieces that a cell can use to put together uh, it, its, its own machinery to give it particular shapes and functions. So in the human genome, we see about 22,000 genes, and you can envisage these as being like a, a big pile of Lego pieces, and you can take different sets of this a pile of Lego and put it together in different combinations. And this creates structures with very different uh, final forms and functions. And just in the similar way, our body or our cells do the same thing. They use different, each different type of cell will use a different subset of genes and turn them on. Uh, they encode different proteins, the machines within the cell which do most of the work. And this gives each different type of cell different functions. So then the key question becomes how does a particular type of cell control which genes are turned on and off? How is it that in one type of cell a certain set of genes are turned on and another type of cell a different set of genes are turned on? Remembering that all of the cells contain the same genome sequence uh, and so they're, they're, all the information is present within that cell. Now of course these genes are encoded within the, the double helix of DNA, our genomic DNA. And this genome is, a, is like a big book, which is the instructions for our cells made of the, the letters A, C, G, and T, the bases of DNA, or the letters of DNA. But through a great body of work now, we, we know that there is actually another code that sits on top of the genome called the epigenome. And this plays really important roles in controlling whether the cell utilizes the, the information in the underlying stretch of DNA. So when you talk about the epigenome, what we're frequently talking about are actually a small chemical tags, like chemical signposts which get added to the DNA sequence or to proteins that the DNA is wrapped and packaged around. And these act like little signposts to tell the cell whether to use that piece of DNA or not. One of the best studied epigenetic tags and modifications is DNA methylation, which is just this small uh, chemical group, CH3, carbon three hydrogens, added to the DNA itself, to the cytosine base, or the letter C in the DNA. Another modification, so our DNA in our cells isn't, uh, isn't just present naked, but it's actually wrapped around other proteins called nucleosomes, or histone proteins. And these histone proteins have these little tails, little protein tails that extend out of the nucleosome, and the cell can actually add different chemical modifications to these histone tails. And they, again, act as little signposts or markers for the cell to either utilize the information underlying that piece of DNA or to not utilize it. So an example would be that these modifications, DNA methylation, histone modifications, can cause the DNA, which might have been open and accessible before, to wrap up around these nucleosomes and become tight and condensed. And in that state, it's not accessible to the cellular machinery that would read and utilize the underlying DNA sequence. So that you can, the cell can change the DNA from an open and readable form to a closed and inaccessible form. Now, a lot of my work is focused on this modification DNA methylation. Again, this little tag. And it's simply the, the modification of a, a cytosine, the C base in the DNA sequence, to a methyl cytosine, which just has this little methyl group added to it. And the cell can add this in different places within the genome. 
And although it's just this very small modification, we know it plays critical roles in a wide range of biological processes. It's essential for development, increasingly finding that if you disrupt it, it affects learning and memory, and it's highly disturbed in cancer. Now, how this typically is thought to work is that conventionally a gene which uh, isn't methylated can be copied into RNA. This mobile copy encodes the protein, so a gene encodes a particular protein. But if these methylation tags are added around the gene, then this can block uh, a protein called RNA polymerase, which creates this mobile message, and essentially this turns the gene off. It can no longer be read, and no protein is made. Okay, so it's seen as a, a type of switch. So uh, by analogy, the epigenome can be thought of as a type of punctuation for the genome sequence. And if you, you can see in our, in our own language, that if you take uh, a string of words and you change just one comma, that it completely changes the meaning of the sentence, of the underlying information. And so it's critical that the, the information within any, any, any system is accurately and correctly controlled and interpreted. So we know now that uh, within the genome of a particular cell type, you can have uh, some stretches of DNA which can be closed and inaccessible, this state we call heterochromatin, which with various epigenetic tags put on it to tell the cell to compact and close it up. In contrast, other regions of the genome that are being used and the underlying DNA is being read it can be in this open and accessible form called euchromatin, which has a different set of these epigenetic modifications. And in any cell, you could take all of the genes and look at their epigenetic state, and you might find that uh, particular genes are in open state and other genes are in this closed state. And now when we compare the different cell types that we find within the human body or indeed any complex organism, we see that in each different type of cell, if you're considering uh, the range of genes within its genome, you'll find that uh, any particular gene might be uh, inaccessible in some cell types, but open and accessible and utilized in other cell types. So each different distinct type of cell in our body has this uh, distinct epigenome. It has the same genome sequence, but it's being used differently because it has this different uh, patterning of the epigenome on top. Now, another way that we can see the, the importance and, and the complexity of this epigenetic information and the way that uh, it sculpts the utilization of the genome sequence is through development. We all start off as a, as a fertilized egg, a single cell. Uh, but through development, this massive complexity arises. We, we become this creature with many trillions of cells and hundreds of cell types. And this new information emerges without a change in the genome sequence. This has been imagined as a type of landscape where you start off as a cell which is called pluripotent. The, that cell has the ability to turn into any other type of cell. But through development, uh, the, the cells will go down these different lineages in the landscape, down these different valleys where they commit to being a particular type of cell, a particular distinct specialized cell type or a differentiated cell. And throughout this process, uh, this process involves the addition of these epigenetic modifications in different patterns throughout the genome in the different cell types. And this can lock in place certain patterns of gene activity in the different cell types, which then define their activity. But there was a, a big advance in 2006 when uh, a guy called Shinya Yamanaka reported that he'd found a way to take a cell in a dish and to force it to take a specialized cell, like one of our skin cells, and to force it to uh, go back up this valley and to become a pluripotent cell again. So you, how you can do this is you can take cells and just force the reactivation. So these are four genes that have been turned off. You can force the reactivation of these four genes, turn them back on, and some of the cells in a process that takes uh, between one to two weeks will reprogram, become these pluripotent cells. And you can then pro probe and prod and tickle them in various ways, and uh, that can cause them to differentiate into other specialized cell types. So for example, we could take a skin cell from you create induced pluripotent stem cells from these and then treat it in various ways to turn it into neurons. Now this uh, offers great hope for, uh, in, in a variety of different ways, one being uh, the, the, the field of regenerative medicine where we could take mature cells from a patient, so specialized cells, turn them into these iPS cells by reactivating these pluripotency genes and then there might be a particular genetic uh, fault within the genome of those cells that's causing this, the, the disease this patient has, 
You can correct that genetic disease now with new genome editing tools, and then you could turn these IPS, induced pluripotent stem cells, into a particular cell type that needs to be replaced within the, the body. They're now healthy because the genetic abnormality has been repaired and put these back into the body of a person. Another way is to study uh, cell types which are, are not accessible and can't be readily tested on in people. It's very difficult to test, uh, uh, to perform tests on neurons of, of patients, for example, because the neurons are in someone's head and people don't, generally don't like to give them away. Uh, but what you can do is you can derive iPS cells from them, from the patient. You can then derive neurons from that patient, uh, in this case, suspecting that the disease is a disorder of the neuronal function, and then test a whole range of drugs to see which drugs might uh, remedy that dysfunction in the cell and they might be candidates for a drug that could be used uh, in the clinic. Uh, we now know that the epigenome is really important for human health and disease, so for normal processes and uh, their dysfunction. It's, it's essential for cellular specialization, going from pluripotent state to uh, specialized cell types. It's essential for our development and increasingly uh, evidence that's involved in memory and learning. We know that because you can take the various uh, cellular machines, the enzymes or proteins, which write or read the patterns of the epigenome, and if you disrupt them, then we see failures in all these areas, cell specialization, development, and memory and learning. So uh, why it's important to understand, to research the epigenome, is that these epigenetic changes are really important and underlie both normal and pathological development. There are different approaches that or the various approaches that people are taking to understand the epigenome now range from first being able to read it, to uh, look at the genome, particular cell type, and say, okay, where are all these epigenetic modifications? Where are these little chemical signposts throughout the genome? And what could they be doing? How do they function to make one cell type different from another? How might this be disrupted in various disease states? And ultimately, can we then go in and repair these or modify these to to, uh, to, if there's an aberrant epigenetic state in a particular type of cell to fix this. So then, one of the, in, in focusing on DNA methylation, one of the, the problems or the challenges in recent years was how do we uh, know where all these tags are within the genome? These, if you remember, this uh, me methylation tag occurs on the C letter in the genome, the, the cytosine, and there are approximately one billion of these in the human genome, which is about three billion bases long. And if we're to fully understand this, the, the impact and the role of this, these chemical tags in the genome, then we need to start from a baseline of, of having a, a comprehensive map of where these are located. We want to know which genes are methylated, which aren't, and ultimately we want to know the single base, the exact site that's, that is methylated and, the, and all the sites that aren't methylated. So the problem that we approached a few years ago was how, to, how could we precisely identify where all these sites of DNA methylation were within the three billion uh, base human genome. And to do that, we first need to be able to sequence a human genome and, and really have been empowered to, to do this research on the epigenome by a huge advance that's taken place in the last eight years in genome sequencing. So we're in the midst of, of really what is an ongoing revolution in DNA sequencing. The first human genome sequence cost $3 billion to to complete. Um, the, the estimate in 2001 for the cost of human genome, one hum, sequencing one human genome was $100 million. But as time went on, so this, is, this graph shows the costs per genome, and it, it's on a log scale, so it goes 1,000, 10, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, uh, and the cost over time. And you can see that it was steadily uh, progressing, decreasing the cost, but then around 2007, the cost really started to drop down precipitously to the point where now we can sequence a human genome or resequence a human genome for approximately $1,500. So the, the costs have gone down dramatically. And this is because there's, there's been the, the development of a new technology called massively parallel DNA sequencing or next generation sequencing on an instrument that looks like this, which is about the size of two washing machines put next to each other. And it takes place on a little thing called a flow cell, which I have a couple here. They're just these little glass slides that have channels uh, where you can put a liquid solution in one end and it flows through the channels and comes out the other end. But you can put the DNA on the surface of this flow cell and you sequence on it. And on a structure like this, on just this one flow cell, you can fit uh, billions of individual fragments of DNA and, see, and on 
on the surface, this sequence billions of fragments at once. So simul on the, the latest instrument, sequen in sequencing instrument, which costs about a million dollars, uh, we can sequence six billion separate fragments of DNA in a period of three days. Each fragment of DNA, you start by chopping up the genome to many little pieces. Each fragment of DNA is about 300 bases or 300 letters long. So if you multiply 6 billion by 300 base fragments, one run of this machine in three days will generate 1.8 terabases, which is 1,800 billion bases or letters of the DNA sequence. So it's, it's yielding a huge amount of information. Now, one human genome is about 3 billion bases long. So in one run of this machine, we can sequence 20 human genomes, 30 times over each, so, so you sequence it very accurately in three days. And this is how we get down to the approximately $1,000 or $1,500 genome. Uh, I want to briefly go over a little of how this works because it's a technology that's not only changing how we're doing our research, but is, is progressively entering everyday life. And uh, we will soon all begin, uh, begin to encounter this. Uh, for example, prenatal diagnosis and testing has been completely changed in just the last few years where you, now you can uh, do prenatal testing of, of the developing fetus from maternal blood rather than doing invasive and, and dangerous uh, procedures of amniocentesis. So this, it's a really important technology which is changing not only research but, uh, but healthcare. What you do is you start by isolating genomic DNA. You could take some skin cells from you and isolate the DNA and then you fragment it up. You break it into billions of different of little fragments randomly approximately 300 letters long. Then what you do is you put it on this flow cell surface, just this little glass slide, and each DNA fragment will stick to these other DNA sequences, little DNA uh, tags on the surface of the flow cell, which will anchor the DNA sequence there. So looking from the top at just a tiny little segment of this flow cell, you would see all these little clusters of DNA, all these individual DNA uh, molecules, which are then ready to sequence. Now the process of sequencing it uh, goes like this. You have these DNA fragments uh, on the surface of the flow cell. And this would be the fragment of DNA from your genome. And you're sequencing it by making the, the, the other copy, the complementary copy. DNA exists usually as a double helix. And if you copy one strand of the double helix and synthesize the, the corresponding strand, then uh, what you can do is by labeling the bases as they incorporate. You can, you can derive the sequence of it. So each base here, the T, T, A, C, or G, has a different colored fluorescent molecule on it. And the machine adds them one at a time and records this fluorescent image so that it can see sequentially for uh, focusing on each, on each individual fragment, it can see sequentially which base is being added and the sequence that the bases are being added. This is called sequencing DNA. You're, you're figuring out the, the sequence of DNA in a stretch of the genome. It does this, though, not just for one strand of DNA, but it does this for billions in parallel across the surface. So at the end of this process, you've generated uh, for each fragment about 300 bases of, of sequence, the, the sequence order of the letters of the DNA code, but you've done this for billions of, base, billions of fragments of DNA in parallel. Then, of course, the problem is that you took this genome sequence and you fragmented it into billions of different pieces and you have to put it back together which is like taking you know, a, a big stack of books and shredding them into pieces, randomly mixing them up, and then having to stitch them back together, uh, which obviously we can't do ourselves. We use computers to do. And as this technology just to do the sequencing has progressed in the last few years, uh, the necessary computing power to do this and the software developments to do this have also had to improve. So it's been a parallel development of, of multiple technologies to get to this point. Now we want to study, there are a huge number of reasons for studying the DNA sequence, from identifying genetic basis of disease, monitoring disease diagnosis and the progression of diseases, from understanding the, the other species on which we rely, uh, various crop plants, for example, tracking infectious diseases and the rise and the evolution of diseases, and uh, the, the whole host of other organisms, a whole range of other whole organisms that we, we play host to. But what we wanted to use this for a few years ago was to focus on studying the epigenome. And so what we did was to use this next generation sequencing technology to map the sites of DNA methylation. We call this the methylome, which is the, the location, the precise location of every single site of DNA methylation in the genome. So how you do this, I'll just see how much time I have left, is um, you start with a fragment of DNA. Uh, and this could be any random fragment of DNA from your, from your genome. 
And in that fragment of DNA, there'll be some cytosines that don't have these methylation tags. There'll be other cytosines that are methylated. What you can do is you can do a really easy chemical treatment where you mix the DNA with a chemical called sodium bisulfite. And what this does is any cytosine that didn't have the methylation tag is converted into a different base, the T base, thymine. However, the cytosine that is methylated is protected from this chemical conversion and remains a cytosine. So after this conversion, in this uh, fragment of DNA, the only cytosines remaining are those cytosines that were originally methylated, whereas the cytosines that were unmethylated, didn't have these tags on them, have been converted to Ts. So that now if you go and sequence this fragment of DNA, you know that everywhere you see a cytosine was a place where in the genomic DNA there was one of these chemical cytosine tags, methyl cytosine tags. So when we do this, well, we can just take human genomic DNA, treat it with sodium bisulfite, and then form whole genome sequencing, and then look at any position within the genome. And wherever we see a, a cytosine, a C letter in the sequence, we know that the DNA was originally methylated in that position. And through this way, we can generate this methylone, this map of the methylation state of basically all of the one billion cytosines in your genome. Now, we did, first did this a few years ago in humans to compare very, two different, very different types of cells. Uh, skin cells and embryonic stem cells. Remember, these embryonic stem cells have the capacity to uh, turn into essentially any other type of cell in the body. And what we found, just looking very generally, was that there was a lot more methylation that was present in these embryonic stem cells than the skin cells. Now, it was known in other organisms, in plants, that there were two classes of DNA methylation. But in humans, it was thought that DNA methylation only ever, occur, ever occurred in this CG context, where when you saw DNA methylation, a methylated cytosine base, it was always followed by the G letter of the DNA code. And that's indeed what we saw in the skin cells. However, when we looked in these embryonic stem cells, we saw that all this extra DNA methylation was actually this new form of DNA methylation that wasn't in this CG class. This CH class, or the non-CG class, was a methylated cytosine followed by any other base except for G. So through the sequencing method, we were able to uh, find this different form of DNA methylation that was present in embryonic stem cells. By looking both at this novel form of DNA methylation in the stem cells, as well as the conventional form of DNA methylation, we found that the, the patterns within the genome of embryonic stem cells were very different to the patterns of methylation that we saw in these skin cells, or mature, which are mature and differentiated cells. And subsequently, what we're able to do is to take embryonic stem cells and, in the culture dish, differentiate them into a whole range of different types of cells and use this uh, methylome sequencing approach to characterize the patterns of methylation in the genome of all these different uh, types of cells. And there you see that the, the patterns of the epigenome, these differentiated cells, are completely different to what we see in the embryonic stem cells. We could also reverse this process. If you remember, I, I talked about this advance that Shinya Yamanaka had made where you could uh, force the reactivation of these pluripotency genes and it converts a specialized cell into this pluripotent cell from which you can then uh, turn it into any other mature cell type. So what we want to ask is, well, when you take a specialized cell and you turn it into a pluripotent cell type, and essentially what you're trying to do is to reprogram that the, the change in the epigenome that had taken place, but does it reprogram completely? So the, the experiment that we did was to take pluripotent, uh, to take differentiated cells, mature cells, to reprogram them into these iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, and to compare the methylome of these iPS cells to bona fide embryonic stem cells. And then what we could do is to turn both iPS cells or embryonic stem cells into mature cell types and see whether any differences in methylation that existed between embryonic stem cells and iPS cells could be propagated to cells that you might derive from the iPS cells. Now, quite amazingly, what we found is that uh, it, the reprogramming of the epigenome of the specialized cell type when you create the iPS cells makes it almost indistinguishable from the embryonic stem cells when you look in general. But when we looked very closely at the epigenome of the iPS cells versus the embryonic stem cells, we found a few hundred places in the genome where the DNA methylation state, represented by these little uh, tick marks here, uh, this is at, at a gene, at the start of a gene. We see that these embryonic stem cells don't have methylation in this region, but all the induced pluripotent stem cells do. And when you derive, so this is this aberrant DNA methylation state in these reprogrammed cells. 
But when you derive mature cells from the embryonic stem cells or from the iPS cells, this aberrant methylation seems to be propagated through differentiation. Now, what we found that is a lot of this aberrant DNA methylation is actually a memory of, this, of the cell type that, the, that we originally started with. So if we started with a skin cell and reprogrammed it to induce pluripotent stem cell, we found that at hundreds of places in the genome, there was a memory of still being a skin cell that was retained in the genome of the iPS cell. And so this might have some consequences for, uh, for utilizing a cell derived from these uh, down the road. All right, so there is now some evidence that if you take uh, mature cells and you derive induced pluripotent stem cells from them, and then you try to turn them into different types of cells versus turning an embryonic stem cell into a range of different specialized cell types, that these iPS cells have a biased capacity to differentiate. And they tend to turn into certain types of specialized cells better than they turn into other specialized types of cells. And they turn, tend to turn into cells which are more like the cells that they originally started from. So again, they have this functional memory of the cell that they started from. What we're trying to do uh, in, in a couple of groups here in Perkins and various other groups worldwide is to develop molecular tools to try to reprogram the epigenome. So we, currently we don't have any effective tools to change the epigenetic tags within the genome short of changing it throughout the entire genome, essentially wiping the whole slate clear. But what we're trying to do is to take uh, proteins that we can now design that are able to bind to a particular place in the genome that we choose. So essentially, uh, like a search function, these proteins can go and find particular sequence in the DNA that we want them to, and they'll stick there. And onto those proteins, we can fuse various uh, domains of proteins that will change the epigenetic state. So for example, we could start with this protein that's called Cas9, and we can program it so it will bind to a particular place in the DNA, and we can fuse onto this protein a part of an enzyme that will add DNA methylation to the genome. And so the aim here is that this protein will be recruited to a target region in the genome that we choose, and it will methylate the cytosines there to edit the epigenome. Similarly, we could, similarly, we could fuse it to enzymes that are able to remove DNA methylation from the genome, or, en or enzymes that are both able to change DNA methylation or these histone modifications. Uh, and so this is an area of technology development that uh, a number of groups are, are pursuing, including us here in the Perkins, which is really trying to develop precision editing tools for changing the epigenome. So just to, in the last few minutes to finish up here, I want to touch briefly on some work that we have done recently in the human brain. Uh, again, looking at DNA methylation, and in particular focusing on uh, this special type of methylation that we found only in embryonic stem cells, this CH methylation. Now, we, we had found this in embryonic stem cells, and what we wondered was, is this present elsewhere within the human body, or indeed the mouse body? And we were looking at the methylome of a range of different tissue types, and what we saw is that this is a browser display, so this is one way we interpret the data. These are, these are different genes here which are encoded in the DNA, and this uh, track here shows DNA methylation, this, this atypical form of methylation. What we found is that in the frontal cortex of adult, adult mice and humans, we saw a lot of this special type of methylation that we had only ever seen before in embryonic stem cells. But when we compared this to the, the uh, fetal brain in mouse or human, we saw that there was none of this special type of, of DNA methylation. So this, uh, it was accumulating throughout development. Now we're interested in, in then tracking this more closely because the process of brain development is, is a long extended uh, developmental process which is really complex. So our brains develop and don't finish developing until we're about 20 years old. And through that period, there are phases uh, of huge changes that the brain undergoes of synaptogenesis, of forming a huge number of connections between neurons, of subsequently many of these connections being pruned and remodeled. And all these changes require uh, changes in gene expression, the neurons or the glia uh, expressing different sets of genes differently over time. And so what we're, and the, these changes uh, underlie the huge plasticity and flexibility of the brain, particularly in children, uh, to learn. It was also known that if you, if you disrupt or you mess with DNA methylation within the brains of, of rodents, that uh, you see dysfunctions in various uh, neurological processes. So if you have dysfunctional DNA methylation pathways in the enzymes that put or remove DNA methylation, or dysfunctional 
disrupted patterns of DNA methylation in mouse or rat brains. These, these rodents show dysfunctions in the plasticity of their neurons and the processes of learning and memory. So what we did was to sequence the DNA methylome in both mice and in humans uh, from the frontal cortex at different stages of development. What we're able to see is, again, that the, the composition of DNA methylation changes greatly over development, where in, in the fetal brain you have uh, almost all the DNA methylation is typical, this regular form, this CG form of methylation. But in the adult frontal cortex, a third of the methylation now is in this alternative form, this CH form of methylation. And did what we could do is take an adult human frontal cortex and separate out different types of cells from that frontal cortex, take all the neurons and take all the glia and look at their methylomes, sequence and map their methylomes. And we found that this special type of methylation is largely present in neurons. So it shows a cell type specificity. But since we had this developmental time course, we could also compare how the different types of methylation change during development. When we look at CG methylation, it largely stays flat, uh, the level of methylation in the genome as you age, uh, from fetal through early childhood, uh, through adolescence, and then through the aging process. But when we looked at this alternative form of CH methylation, we see that it rapidly increases in the first few years of life and then continues to increase in the genome up until uh, the end of brain development, essentially. Now, subsequently, we saw that where this alternative form of methylation, the CH methylation, is located in the genome, genes that have this methylation tend to be turned off. So we think this might be a previously uh, unanticipated uh, mechanism by which neurons regulate gene activity and that it's of great interest that this changes dramatically uh, during the, the period when our brain circuitry is maturing as children. Uh, and interesting, so if you can match this to how our synapses form during this process, and we see that the appearance and these changes in the methylome that we're seeing closely match when synapses, are, the synaptic connections are forming in our brain. So we're currently looking at uh, the, the changes in these patterns of methylation in a range of neurological disorders to try to understand whether these uh, unique features of the brain epigenome might be disrupted in particular disease states. But in general, uh, throughout the world, these, this DNA sequencing revolution allows us unprecedented, unprecedented capacity to look at the DNA methylome and the epigenome in general, see how it varies through space throughout an organism, the different cell types, or spatially throughout a genome, through time in the processes of development or aging, and through various challenges in various disease states or stresses. Uh, we think that changes and uh, perturbations of the epigenome might be really important in how stem cells function and the ability to manipulate stem cells to derive useful end uh, types of cells for regenerative medicine. We've seen that through the process of hu human development, there are huge changes in the epigenome, that it gets remodeled and restructured. And this particularly occurs within the brain and during early childhood. In the future, uh, increasingly what we're seeing is that there are possibilities for disease diagnosis and potentially treatment based on the epigenome. There are already cancer therapies that are based on drugs that broadly disrupt uh, DNA methylation or, or histone modifications in the genome. And in the future, we may be able to do this in a much more precise state by uh, epigenetic engineering, where we can go into a particular place in the genome and modify these chemical tags that are added to it. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge all the, all the people and funding that allow this research to take place. Uh, one thing that I really enjoy about science is that it's, um, you're, not, you're not stuck there doing it by yourself, but it's a hugely collaborative process and you work with a lot of people both around you but also throughout the world. And for all this work that I've presented, we have, have had a, a large range of collaborators from a, a range of countries throughout the world. And of course, this, uh, this all depends on, on the critical funding that we got from various funding bodies. Um, and thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.